Hello, this is Dory Clark, and we are here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Today, we have an incredibly special roster of guests. We are talking about how to use humor successfully in business. And we have Jennifer Auker and Naomi Bagdonis. They are professors at Stanford University and the author of the new book, Humor Seriously, Why Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and life. That is something that we all can benefit from learning just a little bit more about. Naomi, Jennifer, so glad to have you all here. Thank We're you for having so us. We're so happy to be here. Also, Dora, you, um, I don't think there's anyone else who says our title with so much joy and some, and some levity. <laughs> well, coming from you guys, that is a wonderful compliment. So I appreciate it. This is great. So, okay, the first and most important question that I have for you, I'm going to I'm going to address this one uh, to Jennifer, and I'm going to tell you who I'm addressing things to, incidentally, because I've been on on TV programs where there's where it's like a free for all, and it's terrifying. I'm an introvert. I don't like that stuff. <laughs> Um, so just, yeah, you can both weigh in if you want, but I will direct it. We're going to start this one with Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer, how did you convince Stanford University to let you guys have a course in this? How, how does that work? Oh my gosh. Well, if you give them a lot of money and you say, I don't need a salary. No, actually Stanford's an incredibly entrepreneurial place. And so if you just make the argument that there's, there's really good research behind this, um, it's an underappreciated, under leveraged skill that's really important in business. Um, and also you say it's important to, to me, that like it's just incredibly entrepreneurial. So anything that you're researching or obsessed with or want to learn about, you can make the argument to the deans and, and they'll support it. It's, it's a fun place to work. That sounds amazing. I love it. Well, it's good, it's good to know that, that Stanford is ready to just go there. But the other question, and I want to ask this to Naomi, but I, I first want to say, if you are tuning in live, welcome. We want to see who you are. Feel free to, to greet us and let us know where you're tuning in from. So please type into the chat box and let us know uh, who you are and where you're watching from. And also any questions that you have for our wonderful guests, they are Naomi Bagdonis and Jennifer Auker. They teach at Stanford University. And we're talking today about how to use humor in business. So we want to hear all of all the questions that you have. But Naomi, something that I think is probably on a lot of people's minds. Um, we just got out of a global pandemic. Now, this is something that many people would say, gosh, you know, that's, that's not very funny. <laughs> How can we use humor during these dark times when lots of people are just probably not feeling it? Where do we go from here? And, and, and is humor still a valuable tool in the midst of a, a scenario like we've just been facing? Yeah. No, it's not. No, that's a joke. Uh, yes, yes, it is. I think one thing that's so important to recognize is we think of humor as this fun, frivolous thing that's just for the good times. And in fact, it is such a powerful tool for us when times get hard. And part of this is what happens to our brains when we laugh together. When we laugh together, we release this cocktail of hormones that make us feel better in a whole bunch of ways. So it makes us feel more connected to each other, uh, makes us feel more powerful, more resilient, gives us a happiness boost, uh, lowers our cortisol, so it makes us feel less stressed. And so there are all of these ways that laughing and humor is actually an incredibly powerful um, bolster during times that are hard. And of course, um, they're, you know, finding common things to laugh about is a really human reaction to, um, to that, to when things get really hard. So absolutely, this is a time when we need humor probably more than ever. Well, that's great to hear. And we want to greet some of our wonderful friends who are tuning in from around the world. We have Anna here from Vancouver. We've got Cheryl from Minneapolis, St. Paul. David's here from Indianapolis. Sheldon's in South Florida. Uh, we've got Bob from, from Colorado. We've got Bindu in Amsterdam. Oh my gosh. Japar from Zurich. Karen in Boston. Daniel in DC. Todd from New York. We're so happy to have all of you guys here and many more. Uh, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. We're talking today with Jennifer Auker and Naomi Bagdonis. They are the authors of Humor Seriously, Why Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and Life. Now, Jennifer, you and Naomi worked on a study of 
people from 160 countries talking about humor and culture. One of the, the questions that I hear a lot, and I can imagine that you might get all the time, is isn't humor culture specific? If you are going to be deploying humor, how do you avoid pitfalls or, or what are the differences that we need to be aware of when it comes to how people view, view humor as a tool? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for reading the book. Um, good, good, good citation. Um, we often talk about laughter being this, you know, fundamental, um, you know, melody of human conversation, this way of, you know, really connecting. So while jokes across different cultures might be very specific, um, this idea of what it what it takes to make people laugh and what people feel when they laugh together, as Naomi said, is incredibly universal. A second way to think about the universality of this is the, the study that you just mentioned, which was actually data collected by Gallup in 166 countries, um, over a million and a half people were asked this simple question, did you smile or laugh a lot yesterday? And the answer is yes, when you're 16, 18, 20. And then all of a sudden, 23, universally, not just in America, everywhere, the answer becomes no. It, it plummets. So there's this incredible humor cliff that everyone really experiences right around the time they go into the workforce. And it doesn't pick up until around age 80, which is horrifying because the overall life expectancy is 78 for most of us. So, so you don't laugh until you're dead. Tell yes, you. I know. I know. So, but you can make it. Funny, so. Yeah, it's not funny. And again, <laughs> it's a pretty universal thing. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about sort of landmines or ways that different hu uh, humor styles vary across cultures. But I think it's really important to know that universally, we're all sort of in the same um, same spot. Not only that, but universally, we all laughed significantly more on weekends. So we really do know this is something about how humans are really experiencing work right now. Wow, it's really powerful information to, to frame it up that way. Uh, there's this massive humor dearth at work. So we need to work to correct that. And in the meantime, we want to greet Ariana from San Francisco, who's tuning in. We have Marion from Atlanta. We have Ruan from the Cayman Islands. I love it. Steven's here from Nairobi. Uh, so, so many great folks tuning in. Uh, Majul is here. So welcome. And please type your questions into the chat box for Jennifer and Naomi. We're talking about humor at work. Now, the two of you teach a course at Stanford on this topic, and you were mentioning to me before we logged on that literally this summer you were teaching a course, and today is the day of the final presentations that the students are doing. And you were mentioning that there's a kind of uh, humor reframing that you're asking people to do. Naomi, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this. What is it that you are asking your Stanford students to do? And if some of our viewers here are a little bit ambitious and want to try something similar for themselves, how might they go about doing this as well? Oh, I love that. Okay, so um, so our final project is called the Levity Reframe. And that is where, and, and it's based on this principle in class that says the balance of gravity and levity gives power to both. That if we're over indexed on just levity, we're just being goofy all the time, then it's hard to, to take someone seriously. If we're over indexed on gravity, then things can feel really heavy and it's hard to mobilize towards our big important missions. And so what we have our students do is first write down the signature stories from their lives, the lives that have been, the, the stories that have been most um, important, impactful, meaningful, that illustrate their values. So that would be step one for any overachievers out there who wanna do this. And then step two is to retell that story with levity. And we call it a levity reframe, infusing it with humor, infusing it with uh, different perspectives that help you think about it in a lighthearted way. And then they have to do all of that in 90 seconds, stand at the front of the class and, uh, and deliver it. And so you get these incredibly poignant stories from people's lives and you can feel the resilience. You can feel sort of the empowerment when people retell those stories with levity. And we know this from the research too, that, um, that when you have people think about the stories from their lives and reframe them with levity, that it has this incredible impact on not only rates of depression, that those tend to be lower, that stress tends to be lower, 
but also we tend to have greater perceptions of agency in our lives. We tend to feel that we have more control. Um, and so that is the levity reframe. We encourage everyone to go do it and uh, and please send energy to our students who are who are maybe feeling a little nervous right now in, in advance of the reframes. Uh, that's great. Well, we will we will be sending them all the good energy. That is that is <laughs> wonderful. And a question came in from Karen, and I, I think this is great. It's uh, probably on a lot of people's minds. Karen wants to know uh, what are your thoughts on humor and timing. Uh, certainly, something that that any of us have learned uh, who have taken stand up classes. I have actually done this myself. I, I've taken several stand up classes. Uh, is timing is so crucial? Uh, not just, of course, in terms of the delivery delivery of a joke, but also at, at a more metaphorical level in terms of timing, when is it too soon to joke about something? Uh, certainly with, uh, with the pandemic uh, in the early days as everyone was getting their footing and figuring things out, uh, there was a lot of sense of, oh, wow, this is, so, this is so serious. We couldn't possibly joke about it. And then, of course, the cookies in the shape of toilet paper rolls started coming. So I think we're beyond that now. <laughs> but how do you all think about this? Jennifer, what are, what are your per thoughts and perspective about this? Yeah, well, two things. One, um, we have an entire chapter of our book just around sort of the gray areas of humor and how what are the the basic sort of rules of thumb in order to um, offset risks, which are great, you know, especially right now. Um, and some of them are really simple, you know, just a few of them are, it's not about being funny. So don't ask yourself, you know, will this make me sound funny? Ask, how will this make others feel? So it gets you starting to understand how to read the room, understand your audience, understand who's with you. And more often than not, you can start to get more intuition, building that strength around empathy and know, is it too soon, you know, to, to, to make a joke. Number two, never punch down, which simply means not making fun of anyone who's lower status. And number three really goes to this timing question too. You know, are you too close to this? So, you know, and that could be temporarily or psychologically, um, you know, so for example, I can make fun of my mom, but I can't make fun of Naomi's mom, <gasps> who I heard is state. She's, ah, she's a she's... lovely woman, <laughs> not, on, not on, li on the live show, Jennifer, my mother. <laughs> So this idea, you know, thinking through um, these kind of three rules of thumb, and then there's others, helps you understand, you know, is it too soon? How will this land with an audience, et cetera? Um, the other thing I would say is that timing from a delivery perspective, Naomi can talk about this at length, but one thing that I've learned as a non-funny person, someone who never thought they were funny, still not funny, rated the least funny person in my five-person family after the dog, um, is that once you understand your humor style, delivery and timing becomes so much easier to understand. So we find um, that there's four different humor styles. There's the stand-up and then there's the magnet. They're charismatic and infectious and they light up a room. They might be silly. And so their timing is going to be different than Also the just in infectious in a personality way, not in Yeah, not way. just viral. <laughs> yeah, not just like they get so hot and give it to other people. But then there's the sniper and they're, you know, dry and they have their masters of the unexpected dig. So their timing is going to be very different from the magnet, who's a little bit sillier. Um, and then the fourth style is a, a sweetheart. So as you think about which style you are, and Dory, we have a sense of what you are, but we'd love to know what you think you are. So we can describe those four styles in greater detail uh, if you like. But what's important here is that delivery is contingent on what humor style do you use? Ooh, I love it. It's like per personalized, uh, you know, M Myers Briggs, but for humor and <laughs> exactly. probably more scientific than Myers Briggs too. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so that, is, okay, we're going to, we're going to dive into that for sure. But before we do, I should mention to those of you tuning in that we are here uh, with our weekly Newsweek show better. Our guests are Jennifer Ocker and Naomi Bagdonis. They teach at Stanford University and their book, which you can purchase is humor. Seriously. Why humor is a secret weapon in business and life. If you want to learn more about Jennifer and Naomi and their work, just go to humorseriously.com. And if you want to make sure that you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek sessions, 
go to my website, doryclark.com. You can sign up for the email newsletter and get a free self-assessment and you will get reminders about these great shows. Next week, we have Wharton professor Katie Milkman on and she is talking about how to change. So lots of great topics coming up. So Jennifer and Naomi, all right, you had a you had a teaser here. You have uh, you have done your uh, your reading of uh, of me apparently, and you mentioned that there are four different styles, four different types of humor. And if we can understand what our own type is, then we have a better chance of understanding how we personally can deploy humor effectively. Can you go into a little bit more depth about what the four styles are? Are. Let me lead with you, Naomi, uh, and then uh, Jennifer. You can you can pitch in as needed because I know personally when people interview me about my books and they say, "Well, you articulated seven principles." Inevitably, I can only remember say five, and then I have to have someone remind me. So uh, <laughs> please go ahead and start us off, Naomi, and uh, we can go from there. Great. Okay. So um, so we got the four styles: the stand up, the sniper, the magnet, and the sweetheart. So there, we'll start with the stand-ups. Stand-ups are bold, irreverent, outgoing, uh, tend to be expressive with their humor, unafraid to ruffle feathers for a laugh. And so stand-ups you could think of, Sarah Cooper says that she's a stand-up, uh, Amy Schumer. So humor that's sort of not afraid to cross a line and say something bold. Next you've got, let's go to the sweetheart next actually. So sweethearts are the opposites of the stand-ups. So whereas stand-ups are expressive, sweethearts tend to be more subtle. Whereas stand-ups aren't afraid to be aggressive, sweethearts are a bit more affiliative. So they want to use humor that uplifts people, that warms the room. They tend to be really subtle, understated with their sense of humor. Um, and they, they think really carefully about how humor will land on someone. So whereas the stand-ups are going to ruffle feathers and not care what people think, the sweethearts are really going to cater their humor to their audience, make sure that it always feels warm and uplifting. <clears throat> so think like a, a Jimmy uh, Kimmel or a Tig Notaro. Um, some of Bowen Yang's stand-up is more sweetheart, although Bowen also goes uh, goes more um, magnet as well. Bowen Yang from SNL, who's a fantastic comedian. Um, all right, so next we have the sniper. Snipers are edgy, sarcastic, dry. They are, they're, they're the ones who will sort of sit in the wings until the perfect moment when they come in with that zinger. Um, similar to sweethearts, they're also uh, more subtle, but like the stand-ups, they're not afraid to be a bit more aggressive in their humor style. So think of Michelle Wolf is a great uh, sniper example, example. Bill Burr is another great sort of famous comedian sniper style. Um, and then finally we have the magnet. So magnets are uh, outgoing, charismatic, not afraid to be goofy, a little bit silly. They'll jump into characters more easily. So similar to sweethearts, they their their humor is more affiliative. So they want to use humor to bring people together. But similar to stand-ups, they're a bit more outgoing. So they'll be sort of more physical, more outgoing with their humor. You could think of uh, Jimmy Fallon, Chris Red, um, that sort of that sort of humor style. Also, one of our favorite recent exercises was to think about what characters from different TV shows are these styles. So the the um, the magnet would be like a Ted Lasso. Um, Sniper would be a Lucille Bluth from Arrested Development. Um, Sweetheart would be a, a Cheaty from The Good Place. And then uh, Stand Up would be Aquafina from Nora from Queens. So, the, so as I'm so curious what people here think they are too. So if you want to drop into the chat what your style is, that would be really fun to see. Amazing. Good suggestion, Naomi. Yeah, let's do an impromptu poll here, folks. If you're if you're watching this and check it out, uh, please type into the comment box what style you think you are. I love that. And in the meantime, as we are figuring out what everyone's style is, a great question came in from Todd, your fellow author. Todd is the uh, Todd Church is the author of Visual Leadership, uh, and uh, Todd is uh, a Thinkers Fifty Award nominee. What was it for? Was it for leadership? I don't remember anymore, but it was something amazing. <laughs> and congratulations, Todd, for that. And Todd wants to know, uh, can you talk about the difference between telling jokes and sharing humorous anecdotes? Too many people don't know the difference, so let's parse it. How, how do we think about those two things? Jennifer, what's, what's your view on that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, one of the things, you know, jokes is, is basically all about setup and punchline. 
So it's stating truth and then misdirection. And so you get the laugh because of that, you know, very simple formula. Um, and then in contrast, you know, this idea of a humorous anecdote or sharing something um, that might make someone smile, but not left necessarily like laugh out loud. Um, and that is actually kind of the core of our book more generally is just, you know, what are you doing to change the room, to diffuse tension, to be able to share a small window into a personal insight that you have that isn't intended to be laugh out loud per se, and may not have a formula associated with it, but it's a window into you, it's a window into someone else, and the intent is more diffuse just to be able to make, you know, to lighten, lighten the moment. That's where I would start. Naomi, what about you? Yeah, I would say, um, and you can also apply techniques from comedy. You can apply things like joke structure to the stories that you tell. And so, um, so for example, one principle of joke structure is using misdirection. So you want to hide that funny thing that you're sharing until the very end. So a really simple example of this uh, is if the funny part of your story, if the big reveal is that uh, your dog was sitting in your hat, right? Instead of saying that, and then I realized that my dog was in the hat, you would end with, and I realized that in my hat was my dog, right? So just switching that structure can help you tell stories more effectively. Um, that said, the other thing I, I just want to mention here is we have so many executives who come to us and want coaching on how to be funny in the talks that they give or in the workshops they're delivering. And so they'll come to us and they'll say, great, can you tell me some jokes that I, that I should write here? And our response is always, forget jokes, forget the script, just tell us about yourself. You know, what do you love more than other people? What do you dislike more than other people? What's bothering you right now? What's exciting you right now? What's your relationship like with the people that you love? What's your relationship like with your colleagues? And so mining your life for those details, for those stories, for those things that feel really personal to you is where we're gonna get humor that's more connecting, that feels more authentic. And so that is really the place to go rather than thinking about jokes that you can tell. So true, absolutely, and of course, jokes can be, uh, you know, not not that not that this is how it should be, but sometimes people steal jokes or or whatever, and your own life story and experience can never be taken by anybody else because it is it is uniquely you. So uh, I think that's a great point. And we're seeing wonderful comments coming in. People love the four types. I have uh, a LinkedIn user who's tuning in who says, oh my God, I'm typing pretty much every friend and colleague I have right now. Uh, so <laughs> that's pretty fun. We've got uh, awesome. Todd who in fact, yes, was nominated for the Leadership Award. Uh, Todd says he's a sniper. Penelope says, She's a sweetheart. We've got, uh, yeah, Melissa. Melissa's a sniper too. This is uh, awesome. this is great. Ruan is a uh, stand-up. Marion is a blend of stand-up and sniper. So we've got a good cross section here. Uh, I love this. And Marion had an interesting question that I think probably is is on a lot of people's minds. Jennifer, I wonder if you can tackle this. Marion wanted to know how do you balance the use of self deprecation as a humor style? Um, obviously, a little bit is good, um, but you can carry it sometimes perhaps too far and maybe end up um, you know looking bad or looking like a loser. So how do you make sure that you use it just the right amount? Yeah, a couple of insights. One, um, you know, it depends a lot on your status, you know, status in the room and your organization. It's an incredibly powerful tool, especially when you have high levels of status. Um, at lower levels, it can boomerang. Um, a second thing is, what are you self-deprecating about? So one of the exercises that um, we have our students do in our class is rewrite their bio or their LinkedIn profile. And so just with one line of levity, for example, you know, mine mentions at the end um, of it that, you know, I, I won, I won a dance off, um, several da dance offs in the 1980s. 
which doesn't sound like self-deprecation, but somehow it lands that way. And I also actively burn food. And so again, taking an area where you can self-deprecate, that's not important to you. In fact, it's very important for me that no one ever asked me to cook for them. So um, that is the only area that cooking is important to me. Um, that is another way of thinking of self-deprecation. Um, and the, I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, each of these four styles, and by the way, if you want data to tell you what your style is, you can just go to humorseriously.com and take a two minute quiz and you'll get a report of what you are. I make my kids do it all the time because what you understand their style, all of a sudden you start laughing a lot more in the household, not just the organization. Anyway, um, you know, what we find is that sweethearts and magnets, as Naomi said, tend to be really good at creating inclusive environments, making feel, others feel valued. They can read the room often quite well, but they are also, because of that focus, at risk to self-deprecate and take themselves down. So again, they can over-index on that self-deprecation, so they have to be wary of, of that. Um, in turn, you know, um, snipers and stand-ups, because they often tease as a sign of intimacy. So if I make fun of you, it means I like you. We have a, you know, a good rapport, understanding of each other. But that can also be at risk to alienate or offend, especially in bigger environments where people don't really know you. So it's important to understand how, you know, each of these questions kind of vary with with the styles that you that you might take on. Mm -hmm really useful. Jennifer, thank you very much. We are here with Jennifer Ocker and Naomi Bagdonis. They are the authors of the new book, Humor Seriously, Why Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and Life. As a reminder, you can learn more about Jennifer and Naomi and their book by going to humorseriously.com. And you can make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek interview shows by going to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn. You can follow me there and get regular reminders and subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter so you never miss an edition. And if you're enjoying this conversation, please hit the like button and share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from it as well. Now, we have time probably for just one more question. And I, I think this is a really good and Naomi, I'd be curious about your perspective on it. Rod Juan wanted to know, if, if we think we're funny, how do we make sure that we're not coming across as silly or as too unserious to other people? How do we draw the line there? Yeah, Rod Juan, I would, I'm curious if you are a magnet humor style, because we often get this question from our magnets. Um, for for folks who can tend towards being a bit more silly, it's uh, it's two things. One, it's it's making sure that you are in balance. So, are you balancing gravity with levity? If you're just silly all the time, then then that's going to, of course, come across as it's not going to come across as well. And the second thing is recognizing uh, what are your pitfalls and what are your strengths of your humor style. Uh, so as Jennifer mentioned earlier, magnets in particular are really uh, are really comfortable being um, being silly. And if you are in a high status role, so again, this goes back to status. If you're in a high status role and you're using silly humor, that can actually be really powerful because it sends signals to the organization that other people can take risks with humor, that they can bring their full selves to work. So that's actually a really good place to be using humor that's a bit more silly. If you're low status and you're using humor in sort of a silly way, you want to make sure that you have already built the credibility uh, to be doing that, because that's where we can get in trouble with um, with sort of silly with silly styles of humor. Such a great point. I love it. Jennifer Ocker, let's give you the final word. If folks want to learn more about you and Naomi and your work in this field, where should they go? Yeah, humor, humorseriously.com. We also have like a, a three week boot camp, a 21 day boot camp where you get like little messages to your phone or WhatsApp or even on Slack. Um, just one minute or two minutes every morning, just about your humor style or a funny video. So it starts to build up these habits that you can start to deploy in the longer run. So yeah, just come to our, our website and yeah, visit, get us there. Amazing. Thank you so much. We have been here with Naomi Bagdonis, Jennifer Ocker, the authors of the book Humor Seriously. Thank you all for tuning in and joining us. Jennifer and Naomi, thank you so much for being here. 
You're the best story. Yeah, we so think you're a sweetheart you. in all good ways. That's what we think. You know, <laughs> with a you. side of magnet maybe. I, you know, I, I'm frequently compared to uh, to Rachel Ray and Jennifer Aniston, so I will take it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all and have a great week. Thanks, Bye, Dory. Dory.